and welcome to Daft Souls, episode number 41. And now we are over the hill and we're definitely picking up speed, etc. My name is Matt Lees and I'm joined today by Jim Trinker. Hi, yeah. And Kessa McDonald. Hello. How's it going? Good. Good. I should point out to regular listeners that I will be more Scottish because I'm in the presence of another Scot. Mm. And that's how accents work. Yeah, yeah. Is this sort of a multiplier system? Yes. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. If, if you get three, yeah, it's how it sort of works. Of... Actually, I heard a Scottish guy when I was walking from the station to your house, Matt, and I was like, that's a Scottish guy on the phone. He's very upset about something. He was proper going like Capaldi about something on the phone. <laughs> um and I looked over the road, and there's this like sort of stereotypical, really skinny, thin, ginger as fuck, like Scottish guy ranting at somebody on the phone as he walked to his house. And uh, uh, it was a very heartwarming image. <laughs> so, Always a good moment. Um, so that's got I've got to have a knock on knock on effect. So that's made me more Scottish as I came here. So. The amplification system for this <laughs> Scottishness is actually seems quite complex. I mean, I've been playing a ton of Monsanto Four in the past few weeks, but it seems that actually it's more complicated than that. Than the yeah, skill yeah. system. I mean, if you get into a cab, then it's immediately like, all right, pal, you take us down Broughton Street. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. That just happens. Like cabs are like a vortex of Scottish amplification. Yeah. Black cabs. Yeah, so yeah. we were actually going to do this podcast uh, maybe last week or the week before, but we found ourselves in a position where like we couldn't quite make it. But frankly, most of us just hadn't played anything like in a while. <laughs> we're in one of those yeah. weird dead zones in the industry where there's still lots of stuff to play, but mm. um, an absence of big obvious things to be really talking about. So I've been, like I say, going back quite into the... the uh, this is the phrase that came to my head, so I'm just going to use it. The firm dragony bosom of Monster Hunter 4. <laughs> well, that's it. It's not that uh, we haven't been playing games so much, but especially you and I, we've been playing Bloodborne and Monster Hunter yeah. for about three months now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. It takes a very long time to get anywhere. Yeah. I mean, mainly because in Bloodborne I'm slow, but in Monster Hunter it's because the game never actually ends. <laughs> yeah, it literally um, doesn't. I've got 100 hours in, and it's just started introducing new mechanics, and it's like, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like I just I'm not expecting that. Ten out of ten longevity. It's Do you it, remember when things used something. to score on longevity? Yeah. I think IGN used to when I started they had like a longevity or play what was it? Last ability. Yeah. So many people word. don't remember that. Because I did a joke video recently which was um an overhaul for my reviewing system where yeah. the joke was that it started off with five different categories that'd all be scored out of a hundred and then That's exactly what IGN did. And then there were subcategories within that and it ended up becoming this sort of like this rabbit hole of intel it was just this sea of like stupid things that would all be scored. Yeah. And so many people didn't know that it was a reference to the way things genuinely used to be. Yeah, yeah. Remember every yeah, magazine yeah. you used to pick up, it was like last ability, graphics ability. Yeah, replayability. Sound, that was sound, the other one. sound yeah. was good. Multiplayer out of ten. So, Always funny when you get a game like I think Zelda Ocarina of Time or something over like nine, nine, NA. nine, nine. One out of ten for multiplayer. So that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it does make sense because it, it doesn't have any multiplayer. Yeah, so it's a one. So it's just terrible. Yeah. It's like the worst multiplayer you can get. <laughs> Jesus, Keza. Non-existent. You call yourself a game you have... journalist. <laughs> you can always have someone watch you. That's multiplayer. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But I've been very slowly chipping away at the multiplayer for that on Monster Hunter because my brother's in G-Rank and I've been slowly catching him up. And it, actually, it's kind of nice because you realise that G rank gets slowed down to it's like that's like the third tier of difficulty. It gets slowed down to such a crawl mm. that actually it doesn't matter if you take a while to catch up with them because by the time you do, you'll still be able to do stuff together in a meaningful way, even though you, yeah. they've played it for two hundred hours and you've played for a hundred. But yeah, the uh, returns do diminish past a certain point with Monster Hunter. I think <laughs> they do. And also, I've realised like uh, you've gone. I've gone through the veil with it. You know, really I went. I went to a point the other day where I just ran through the same bit, mining the same thing over and over again about eight times, just so I could get enough thing to make a new hammer. And I'm like, you are just grinding now, dude. <laughs> you are just sitting and spending your afternoon <clears throat> grinding. Although I've realised one thing that's clever about it, and one thing that um, I'd like to think about and look into more is the nature of. I don't mind grinding if it's completely my choice. And what's interesting about Monster Hunter is it gives you this wealth of different things you can go off and do. And you never really have to grind if you don't want to. But you always do because you find yourself setting yourself these little missions. You go, I'm going to do this. And then that, that will involve loads of grinding. But nobody's ever said to you, you can't do this until you've done this. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is interesting. That's, I mean, that, when you get to a stage when you're, you're setting little goals in your head and just achieving them, that's, that, that's sort of nirvana for mm. me when you... 
you got a big open game like that, you can start doing that. And never actually got into Monster Hunter, but um, yeah, I, I can totally see the appeal. It's the best for that, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it's also a bit dangerous because you find yourself, if you're not careful, yeah. it's so easy to lose track of your own process because you think, all right, well, if I kill this monster, then I'll be able to get this item to upgrade this weapon. But then you go, eh, I'm not very good at killing this monster, though. But if I had this weapon, I'd be really good at killing this monster. But then to get this weapon, I need to kill this monster. <laughs> and then you think, actually, it might be easy to kill this monster if I had this set of armor. And to get this set of armor, I need to kill this monster five times. And then before you know it, you just sort of think, by the time you've actually done all the stuff that you needed to do, you've completely forgotten what what you yeah. were doing in the first place. Yeah. Usually yeah. it doesn't matter because you've since got something better, but yeah, yeah. it's... At some points you think, why am I killing this electric unicorn again? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I don't even know, and I've been doing it for hours. <laughs> uh, there was a sad story. I, a friend of mine's uh, little seven-year-old boy was playing Monster Hunter with him, and he was so proud. He was like, oh, this is amazing. My son yeah, is yeah. a gaming prodigy. This is awesome. Yeah. And they were out going hunting together and taking down, like, your great Jagai and so on, and doing pretty well. And then um, he would uh, go off to work for the weekend, and in the evenings he'd suddenly come up and say, like, look, and he'd show him a bit of Gore Magala. Yeah. Stuff and he'd be like, "Oh, well, you've done the Gore Magala! Look at you! You've done this! Is so amazing!" And then he find out after about two weeks that he'd just been going online and like hanging back oh. and carving at the end, just carving up everybody's kills and then making stuff out of him and pretending like he'd yeah. done it himself. Done it. Yeah, and I was like, "That is heartbreaking. I would be so sad." <laughs> <laughs> and he said he was like disproportionately upset because really, it's not that great of a. Yeah, you know, it's not that bad of a thing. For it's a crime, to, but Kesa. it feels like a crime, doesn't it? That boy like... should be shot. <laughs> um, and finally, actually, in a Dark Souls crossover, you may remember if you listened in the Christmas edition, which we did, which was about kind of um, some fitness stuff and the way that, that can relate to games. Um, I'm still doing a lot of climbing, and for the first time ever, I managed to do one of the red routes on the climb walls, which is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were joking that then accidentally, the next time we went climbing, I was wearing a red t shirt, and there was a bit of a cross in with Monsanto this idea of being like. I've conquered red. I'm, now, I may wear I'm red. now allowed to wear one piece of red clothing. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can do more, I like the idea of. I just thought it'd be great, like color coded clothing mm -hmm. of being like. He's wearing red socks. So what is wearing red socks? That means he's done this. I, I do wish in everyday life your clothing did reflect your skills and aptitudes. <laughs> like if you're just, you know, if you've got if you've got a master's degree in literature, you just get to wear a big quilled hat yeah, everywhere yeah. you go. Yeah. And you're only allowed to wear that if you've done Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Or whatever. Like you know, a jacket made of books. <laughs> jacket made of books. Well, the shoulder that. pads at least. Yeah, yeah. That will work. Seems that you look like a sort of like literary judge dread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That That'd would be, be awesome, fine. right? <laughs> If you had a science degree, you could go around with a space helmet on. Yeah, yeah. But only you were allowed to do that. <laughs> and, like, great. and just the helmet as well. The rest is <laughs> yeah, just a completely business normal. Suit. Yeah. yeah. See, that's what I was getting at. I think it's a good system. I think <laughs> as a world, we need to embrace this outfit-based um, hierarchy. Yeah. Anyway, um, what have you guys been playing? I played a bunch of Broken Age. Broken Age. Which was super good. Because I played the first part, and mm -hmm. I loved it, and I, it, I tried to get everyone to play the first part because I thought the cliffhanger was just wonderful. Really good cliffhanger. Um, obviously, we won't spoil anything at all here, but I've heard that the second half was a bit disappointing. The only thing that... I mean, I'm most of the way through it. I don't think I'm... I'm not finished, but I'm most of the way through mm -hmm. it. I think the only thing that's different that I don't like is that you now can't play those two halves. You can't play those two neat halves. Mm -hmm. there, there's, you've got to flip between them now. <clears throat> not to okay. give anything away but you've got to flip between the two stories now and I just wasn't playing it like that so I got to a point where I just didn't know what to do and I ended up looking it up and it turned out that it's because I was supposed to flip and do something else and that's and kind of annoying else. especially if you've played the first one and you don't expect it to then yeah exactly there's nothing that really says that you should because I like playing it as two distinct halves and it just occurred to me then that maybe everybody else did flip around all the time no I was I really enjoyed just being in the story and finishing it and that's right when you have to flip to a different story it does take you out at the moment Maybe they didn't get that people weren't doing that though because no. they they always had it so you could switch between. But maybe maybe they got all their backers on their backer forum saying we want it so you have to switch between more and that's what they that's what they Who did. Knows? Who knows? But yeah, it's it's very good. I mean, it's such a it's such a it's a warm bath of a game. It's so beautiful and mm. I haven't found I've had some people say that they find the puzzle design quite annoying, but I've not had problems. with Yeah, it I think the puzzle design isn't great. I mean, I um, got my mum to play the first part of Broken Age and she was really enjoying it, but I, I found frustratingly she got. Um, one of the weaving based puzzles in the first half and she just got she just couldn't do it and yeah I think that that's a bit annoying because I really it was a short experience and I just wanted to get through it and finish the story and stuff but mm. she just got a bit stuck well that's it and there's always one thing you get hooked on and you just someone has to reach in and rescue you you know you have to have someone watching or someone you can ask 
or you have to ask the internet because mm. there is a point at which your own ingenuity you just haven't seen something you know and no matter how many times you walk around the same six mm. rooms you're not going to see the thing that you keep yeah, missing yeah and it's different because this is a much shorter experience it's much more story driven back in the day if you had to go and look up like um, you know uh, what to do in Day of the or in uh, Monkey Island like you weren't terribly likely to stumble onto spot uh, onto plot spoilers that would annoy you. Yeah. Whereas also, with Broken like, Age like that, that's quite easily something you could do. But what I don't quite get about people who say that Broken Age has bad puzzle design is that all old adventure games had worse puzzle design, I think. Like, yeah, that's true. Much. Let's be honest. Like, they were, they were in highly enjoyable, but the puzzles didn't make any sense. Mm. And uh, most of them were, you know, you could get there yourself, but it wasn't... You know what I mean? It wasn't like if if you think Bro- Broken Edge has some obscure puzzles, then try playing no. Indiana Jones or. Well, Indiana I guess Island. that's it. That's the mental thing. The, the whole LucasArts thing, like the, the, the standing piece of advice, was always, "Well, have you have you clicked on everything with, with everything else?" And it's just like, well, if you if you if that's what you resort to doing to get through this bit of the game, that's shit. Mm, it's bad. Yeah. So uh, Broken Edge you, never makes you do yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, no. that that's. I mean, at least that's. I mean, at least they've evolved to the point where they don't do that anymore. Because when, when you're saying, yeah, you, uh, have you used this with this? Have you tried to combine everything yeah. with everything else? You know, this is is because I, I play Broken Edge with my partner who grew up on Lucas. Well, yeah, didn't yeah. grow up, but when he was like in his early twenties, played a lot of Lucas Arts adventures. And so that's how he plays adventure games. So whenever I have to hand over the controller, I find it intensely irritating because I just watch him try and combine nonsensical things with other nonsensical things. Now like, that's not logical. Yeah, yeah. But he's like, well, it's never logical. It didn't used to be logical. Mm-hmm. What you combined with, you know, it used to just be trial and error at yeah. the time. But yeah, there was a bit in Broken Age in the second act where I just basically didn't see something. I didn't matter how many times I walked around, I wasn't going to see it. And that's mm-hmm. when that's when those games kind of fall apart a bit and they start to become, you know, you start to see the Matrix code. Rather yeah. than just enjoying the art and story in there, but I still really, really love it. I think it's great. I'm glad it exists. Thank you, Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I'm looking forward to playing part two. I've loved part one. I really did. Um, but yeah, I just, I kind of like to just, I kind of found a solution in the first part. I just, it's one of those things where I guess the problem is they'd sold the experience of being like, you know, you, you're going to get a an old school point and click, and they pared down a lot of that, and they would reduced a lot of. Yeah, what it's it not used to life be. is strange. Do you know what I mean? Like, no, which but, has almost no puzzles. But at the same time, it mm. just I kind of felt like for me, I didn't need the puzzles as much. Like I was just I just enjoyed the story so much. I thought Vela especially, like her half the oh, story was just Bella. so awesome. She's so cool. I just enjoyed breezing through it. As you say, it's a warm bath. It's like really nice. And actually, mm-hmm. I would say if you haven't got it yet and checked it out, it's probably worth holding out because if you do have an iPad like lying around, it's gonna be like. Probably something that in a couple of years, like you know, be able to get an iPad for a couple of quid or yeah. and just have a lovely afternoon sitting on the sofa think, playing yeah. it. If you haven't played part one, good because uh, we actually had to replay part one because we'd forgotten everything. Yeah, so, really? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I, I remembered it better, but I, we, we decided I to do it part one when it was first like released. Yeah, yeah. A year ago. I can't remember anything about really? it. Really, so. I played part one. Um, I think I reviewed it actually for Video Gamer, but um, yeah. I loved it. I remember it really quite vividly. I yeah. could remember most of it, but there were certain. Like, I remember because we we kind of rushed Jay's bit. And I've forgotten almost all that. I remembered everything about Vela, but nothing yeah. much about Shay. So we just played it again, like, and it works better as, as a two-part. Yeah. It works better if you just go straight through as one game. Yeah, which I is imagine what it of would. course was supposed to be. I think maybe there was a lot of other good stuff coming out at the time. I don't know. But, That's right. Uh, there was a lot of games at yeah. that time last year, and it was just after the PS4 and Xbox One came out. Wasn't yeah, it? it was busy times. Yeah. Busy, yeah, times. busy times. But yeah, I think I, I want to play through the whole lot now. Probably because I play through the first half of my eldest uh, daughter. And oh, that's lovely. So she, bet she loved it. Uh, yeah, she she loved it. So yeah, uh, I think we'll I think we'll just go through the whole lot. Um, I don't know how long is it, by the way. Is the it the second a bit? Like all of it. In one, probably like six to eight hours. That's fine. We'll do it. Anyway. Yeah, it's it's pretty. <laughs> Doing a Sunday. Yeah, 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 totally. It's pretty sure, but it's just got some lovely characters in it, actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really, such good, really nice just characters. Such nice, warm characters. Like it's, it's so there's so there's zero cynicism in that game. That's what I like about it so much. Yeah, yeah. there's nothing world weary about it. It's just one that's imaginative. Like you see things in it that I've never seen before. It's great. That's cool. It is cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I need to go back and play part two, actually. I've been very bad at starting things and not finishing them. I started the uh, the Telltale's Game of Thrones thing, and I haven't gone back and played any more yeah. of that. And there's like three or four episodes of that. Yeah, now, I've right? got two episodes of that hanging yeah, about. I'll t- tell you what, I, I, I really liked the first sort of 20 minutes, I think, of the first episode that mm-hmm. I played. And I was like, all right, okay. It starts off at the, the pivotal, outside the pivotal yeah. thing that's yeah. going on. And um, 
I don't. I don't know. It just by the end of it, it just the whole thing had pissed me off. Not pissed me. <laughs> that's 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 an extreme. Um, but angry Jim. <laughs> yeah, I, got, right I, I got so annoyed by a video game. No, it, it just um, <laughs> just felt like uh, it's not really. If it, it just felt really really pointless in a way that Walking Dead never did. Right. Um, you know, because even though it's attached to this big property and everything, Walking Dead, for example, is so. Um, it's malleable, isn't it? Yeah, like, you can do what you want with it. You, you mean you, you can have a group that you know that, that that's on the other other side of the continent, and you know you can you can do whatever you like. It's not what they did. And also, you know I, mean, I mean, they've kind of already with Walking Dead, they've already kind of broken the canon. The yeah, whole thing yeah. with the Walking Dead is you can keep resetting it as many times as you want because the idea is that each time it might have the same characters, but you don't know what's going to happen to any of them. Yeah, and you yeah. don't. The order of the <clears> events doesn't matter and stuff, and so yeah, you can have that overlap without it being like true careful exactly, fan service. Yeah. They don't have. To, they don't have to be so careful that they're not stepping over any toes. That's on the TV it. I feel like in Game like of Thrones, they're on. A, they're yeah. under a lot more yeah. restrictions. Well, I, I but, played the whole thing in the first episode, and actually, I really liked the way that it seemed to be using, um, particularly in the first episode, your knowledge of the characters against you. Oh yeah, mm. that was very clever. Like you'd you'd meet Cersei, and you'd think you'd know what to do in front of Cersei. Yeah, and that would backfire. Or with Tyrion. And the thing is, you because you don't know what they're like inside the game's version of the universe. And also it's the problem that you don't know what they think about that character. Exactly. Really. You don't know if they don't give a fuck. Well, well they, they, they clearly you... don't. No, yeah. no they well, don't. Well, why would they, you know? You wouldn't yeah, expect them to, exactly. really. You didn't imagine most of the characters like, listen, I've got a lot on. <laughs> it, <laughs> Who are you? It was weird, actually, <laughs> talking to Tyrion as, like, you know, as... You're you're just a shit monster. You're not watching Tyrion doing something important. You're mm. watching Tyrion talk to some... In, you know, handmaiden essentially. So that was weird. But yeah, by the end of it, I just got the impression that all right, so so they they, they have actually they're, they're kind of retelling stuff that's already happened to other characters in this universe, yeah. and I'm getting the distinct impression that nothing hap- that happens here is going to have any lasting effect on anything. So um, I just it, it left me really cold. Um, I don't know, so, I quite yeah. enjoy the fact that the characters were completely detached from the main story and you know that there's not going to be any crossover there and just, but just allowed to give you a flavour and be like okay well just just deal with a little deal with living in this world now and mm-hmm. deal with living in this turmoil and and the fact that like lots of the situations in the first episode seem to really closely mirror situations from the books Yeah. Uh, but this idea of being like oh well now you're in a similar position I have, I'd say I haven't played anymore so I don't know uh, how yeah. well it fleshes out but I have said in the past I think it does feel like the the Telltale's trick is like wearing thin now. It's like mm. they can't just. Well, maybe they can. I, I'm in two minds. Either they can't just keep doing the same trick over and over again and everything, or they can, but it just becomes that thing of being like, uh, for every series they do it for, like people just like will introduce a new friend and you'll just be like, what's your favorite one? You just you play a couple of these. Which ones? Oh, have you played a Telltale game? Oh, what do yeah. you like? Oh, you should play this one. Like, mm. and just the idea of it not being something that with most publishers and the studios you, you love the studio yeah. you play all of their stuff it just being a thing of like you play a couple and then you're kind of done with it like uh like like i, I want to say like, like i was gonna say like the nintendo series is almost like you know what to expect from them like yeah you know a mario like a mario series or a zelda series where you like, wouldn't chain mario games zelda? would you you wouldn't no. like you wouldn't buy like six mario games and then play them no, all back yeah to yeah back. very few people who play unless a nintendo finesse i don't i think most people play a couple of mario games or maybe three but they're all you know what to expect from them is the thing, and they're all worth playing. But I think most just, most people will just pick yeah. like a favorite couple. I guess that so. Makes sense. To change lanes, actually, I've been playing a little bit of um, Hyrule Warriors on the Wii U. Yeah, mm. it's kind of fun. It is fun, isn't it? I like it. I mean, I've always kind of quite liked um, Dynasty Warriors, but I've always also I felt you were just going to say I've always quite like hitting things, murder, and, uh, yeah, death, swords, <laughs> hitting magic. Hitting things is. I mean, when you're hitting like fifty things with one spin of your sword, yeah. it's, it's really mean, there's something really intoxicating about it. Yeah, there is, and I've always thought two things. I've always thought I used to like Disney Warriors games on like the PS2 and stuff, mm. but I also thought, man, these would be so much better if the technology could have loads more enemies on screen. And it's like, ding! Now we can do that. So now you can be hitting a really satisfying quantity of things at once. And also, like I like Disney Warriors games. I like the cheesiness. I like the they're just running around slashing stuff up. But at the same time, like it's a bit of a dry 
like palette, isn't it? I always mm. felt like you'd be like, well, here's yeah. a here's a fat old Chinese guy, or here's a sexy lady Chinese lady, and, <laughs> and all sexy of the lady ra- Chinese guy. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, there's probably one of there. But there's it's like you've got the variety of the weapons. Yeah, uh, but there's not. You don't get surprised by Dynasty Warriors. Like the biggest surprise it can do is like, oh, the sky's gone dark, and shit, yeah. Lu Bu's back. Like with, with the Zelda one, you get these lovely, just random moments. It's mad shit history. going like, on. There's like a Dodongo, and it's like, oh, I gotta put bombs in that. You know, you just get these little <laughs> little moments where it's like, I you just, know what to do. Here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Big yeah. Dodongo, you put bombs in his mouth. He gets knocked over you, then you bash him up. Yeah. You have one fight, which I was just like trying to fight all the enemies, but the room was also filled with cuckoos, the chicken things. Yeah. And so you end up hitting them loads and then like you piss off the chickens and then there's like big golden chickens coming after me it's and stuff. It's a huge in-joke. All it is. Hyrule Warriors. That's what's lovely about it. Hero Warriors is just, it uses the rich like stuff of Zelda to mm. make this wonderfully silly thing and you still got the ridiculously like kind of cheesy like cross between like techno and, and like guitar so- solos powering away in the background mm-hmm. and collecting stupid shit and it's just like a perfect fit yeah. for Dynasty Warriors I always felt like Dynasty Warriors was a really fun game with a really quite dull theme mm-hmm. whereas yeah. this is like a fun game great theme yeah <laughs> and it's like this is cool um, <laughs> uh, but yeah it's yet another game as I'm finding at the moment maybe it's just I'm getting too old old for this shit as the people in the film say uh, but I, I I love all these games but so many of the games I love at the moment it's huge things that you just expected to plough in hundreds of hours or like yeah. I'm still not yeah. done with Bloodborne no it's been you know the thing is it's not even been that long like in normal real world terms it's been what a month and a bit since it's come out yeah but everybody's like oh man you're being so slow playing that I'm like well I've got to do stuff for the weekend the <laughs> like, split between uh, time. the split between yeah. like how normal people play games and how um people are expected to cover games for the kind of the, the very hardcore group of people who are really following that sort of thing is crazy because I mean I find that like you know a lot of people have finished Bloodborne within a couple of days of it coming out well, and crazy. Yeah, I mean people have they just they just chain through it and you know the, the the Reddit page for Bloodborne was just going nuts and everyone was just and lots of people are done with it now lots of people are long done with it because they just finished it in like a few days or a week or whatever they're done yeah. uh, whereas I still have lots of people it makes me feel good that I'm not alone. I have lots of people saying, oh, I'm not keeping up with your video series about Bloodborne because um, I've watched two episodes, but I don't want to spoil anything for myself because I'm still playing. This is a big part of the big editorial change we made at Kotaku last year, where yeah. we just started covering stuff way more after it's out than before. Because mm. it turns out that when you write a story about... You know, we, there was a good example of this was a story about Pokemon's Lavender Town, mm-hmm. 15-year-old game. Did brilliantly because people can relate to that. You know, unfortunately, what tends to happen is that people stop covering a video game at the second that everyone starts playing it, which mm. is absurd, really. And yeah. of course, like, this isn't like, an, you know, Kotaku's not the only outlet that's had this idea. I think everybody's sort of slowly moving towards this idea that the review isn't, like, the end of the mm. of the coverage, like, potential of a game. It's the start of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So Hyrule Warriors is all right if you have a Wii U sorted. You've been playing, though, Jim, you've been playing a ton of... Pillars of Eternity, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm supposed, I I'm supposed to be finishing my review, which was put up as a review of pro in progress um, weeks ago, and it's such a it's such a huge game, and I'm determined to play it properly and play it as I would, because I hate blasting through stuff it's just to get as an to adult, what isn't it? Like you end up score. hating it. Yeah, exactly. So I'm I'm kind of enjoying it at my own pace, and I um. And luckily, you know, video gamers are fine with it because you know we're we're actually just using video games as an excuse to take the piss. So um, <laughs> uh, I don't know when I'll actually get to a point where I can do a score. Probably twenty seventeen. I'm not sure it matters really that much anymore. But um, it's a fantastic little game. I I never I never imagined that I'd love it as much as I do. Mm. Um, and considering the sort of the kind of RPGs that I like. So your Bioware stuff and your Bethesda stuff and stuff that really has an emphasis on, particularly with Bethesda stuff that has an emphasis on, on on trying to really place you in the world and, uh, and 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 giving you a sort of uh, like a tactile sense of being in the world. You can pick up every object. You can, uh, you know, all, all your all your actions have sort of immediate kind of physical consequences in the world, and mm. you know it's all from a first person perspective and. Then you know you, you go to something like Pillars of Eternity, which is obviously a sort of a reimagining of of the, 
the Baldur's Gate Infinity Engine. So did you never play that sort of thing back in the day? Um, no, no I, I really didn't. Wow. Um, back in the day, no. I think when, when Baldur's Gate came out, I was probably just playing GTA and, you know, uh, drinking Sunny Delight and being oh, an idiot because yeah, I was yeah. a kid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. No, uh, I find that fascinating, though. It, it's it's really it. weird. I mean, because y- you would think that Pillars of Eternity, I mean, well, it, like, one of its stated goals is we're making this for people who liked Infinity yeah, Engine exactly. games. Yeah, exactly. It's just like the old sure. CRPG um, golden era. Exactly. It's going to come back in a big way with Wasteland and everything as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. And then and here I am, somebody, and that stuff completely passed me by, and I'm like, this is amazing. Well, Divinity Original so, Sin as well last year, because that sold that stupidly good. well. And it's yeah. a really good game, and I think that... A, Probably half the people who played that weren't CRPG nerds from the 90s. Oh, yeah, they're they're definitely current not. nerds from now. Definitely like not. Like me. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Definity Original Sin as well. It's, I mean, there would have been a lot of people playing that and loving that who would have had no idea that there was an entire Divinity series before it that was yeah. mostly terrible. But, uh, yeah. I mean, I was one of those. I, I knew that there was a Divinity series, yeah. but I played a couple of them. Always very interesting games, but often very bad. You play the I first hour, it. and then, yeah. The first, the first I, I, I used to help run a crappy website when I was, like, 14, like yeah, everybody yeah. of my generation did. Yeah. <laughs> but um, one, of the guys who, um, one of the guys who ran it with me did a review of one of the Divinity games. I can't remember which one. Maybe even Divinity 2 back yeah. then. It was old. But I remember because we gave it like a six out of ten or something, and then we just got hate bombed by Divinity fans for literally six months afterwards. They seemed really dedicated. Well, they must have been. That's just very well our, organized. Hating back our then. pathetic little website. Yeah, they didn't have eight chan or anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the Divinity forums. But yeah, they 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 properly stuck at it. Those guys. But yeah. that was that was my only experience of Divinity. Original before. Sim was original was, Sim, which was, was great fun. Lovely. It was really fun. I really liked the combat system. I really liked the interaction between the elements. And bringing back that kind of old school Fallout yeah. pip system for uh, like action points, very simple. Yeah, it was kind of the writing was pretty good, but it was it was lacking something. It felt like the whole world was a little bit. There were moments where you were really expected to very much look the other way in terms of suspension of disbelief, in terms of noticing strings, in terms of noticing things weren't quite right. But the very brief amount of time I spent with Pillars of Eternity, I'm talking maybe about five or six hours, like I was really blown away with just how mm. much like polyfiller they put in in terms of like everything being smooth and sealed together and feeling really tight like mm. I, I really want to go and play more of it but I'm still playing Bloodborne and Monster <laughs> so I've got to finish Bloodborne before Witcher 3 comes out as well because I just won't yeah part of me I'll finish neither if I don't finish part of me is really hoping that Witcher 3 comes out and it's terrible just so I don't have to play it <laughs> just so you can get on with pills or just so I can do something else <laughs> well we got your usual sort of June, July, August period with almost no games no so, I know there'll I know. be time it feels like this every kind of March yeah. when you're still recovering from yeah. last year's crazy influx of games and I think I think I've talked about this on the podcast before, so apologies for repeating myself. But like when we were kids, you could feasibly play every good game. Mm, yeah. It was yeah. kind of, ex- but it's just not possible. Even if you have all the time in the world now, you can't play every yeah. good game. It's There's stressful. So many of them. It really stresses me out. It is stressful, out. but it's okay. Like, I feel like modern pop culture, this goes for like TV and films as well. It's become like a giant intimidate and, and books. It's become like a giant intimidating checklist of things that you have to do. Yeah, I think we approach it the wrong way sometimes. It's okay to just to to dip, to, to pick things and play them. And it's not it's not it's not like a a list of stuff you have to play. It's a but list I've paired it back. Like. I've paired it back massively now in terms of like the things that I actually play now to quite a niche selection of things. Like I I just most games I just go I'm never going to play, and I just put them to one side. And I just but even now even with my very niche selection of things I play I can't keep up. I can't keep. up. I think up. games are so brilliant now and that there's just. Wherever you like, there's a whole year's worth of things to keep you entertained. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When there'd be like two yeah. things a year would come out that you really loved and everything else you're just playing to fill the time. Mm. But Pillars, I mean, I have played, uh, I got beyond having like the whole bit with your own keep and stuff, and that seemed very pleasingly like mm. things to tweak around with and upgrade over time. Mm, yeah, that's uh, about, uh, that is about seven hours in according to the review guide. <laughs> yeah, I remember I got so, the review guide and I was like, yeah. this is crazy. But It's mental. How do how, you measure that? But there we go. We measured it. So Yeah. And it is. I like the way you are kind of cleverly pushed there. You know, mm. I mean, I, I mm. thought that it was very nice in the fact that at first it, it kept giving you the illusion of like more choice than you actually had. But mm. it did it in a really nice way to keep the momentum going with the story. Especially in the first hour, actually, I really like the way it flipped it on its head with like you know it looks like it's gonna be a very trite traditional RPG thing, but then just keeps you guessing, keeps surprising you, and that ran up for a good two or three hours. When it starts to open up a bit, does it get a bit intimidating in terms of just like the amount of things that you can do? 
When you hit the first city, um, is the city's like separated into districts? And I think I've like, just a, got it's there. It's a proper like Baldur's Gate kind of city where it's like, oh shit, like <laughs> there's a billion side quests now, and it's like it's that thing you were talking about earlier actually with Monster Hunter where you've just got layers and layers of things where you just like right so. Okay, so I need to do this quest to, to and you can kind of see the game unfolding, right? So I've obviously got to do this to get to there, and then I need to do. So um, when it, it kind of treats you gently until you get to that point, yeah, and then after that you're like, right, okay, got stuff to do now. Um, but so that's that's basically what I'm working through at the moment, and then and and now I've, I'm kind of on the path because it's been mentioned a few times in a few quests where I need to go to the next city because there's two massive yeah sort of metropolitan hubs if you like in uh, in this in in the game and uh, yeah it, it's really starting to to hit the point. Although one great thing about Pillars of Eternity is that it, it never feels overwhelming. You feel like uh, maybe slightly intimidated by how much stuff there is to do, but I've never felt like, and I felt like this with Divinity Original Sin, Wasteland 2 was really bad for it, where you just hit a point where it's just like, there's too much, there's a brick wall. Um, like uh, Actually, Witcher games I often feel like that as well. Like mm. you Usually by the middle of the second act of a Witcher game, I'm usually at the point where I'm just like, I can't remember why I'm here, I don't know if I care. <laughs> so even that so, you don't care is you can't remember whether you care. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but but yeah, Pillars has really avoided that, despite the fact that it's still like stuffed with all this stuff to yeah. do. But I love that you were um, driven forward by a simple premise, which is actually like another really neat one of like, I love the way that, uh, especially RPGs of that nature, mm, like yeah. always manage to get around <clears> that. Like obviously, you know, this is spoilers for games going back away, but obviously Planescape Torment, the whole point was that you were immortal and you couldn't die. But because yeah. of that, you'd had many lives and it meant that people who looked just like you, but maybe were nothing like you, had done things in your wake. So you had a reputation in the world, but you didn't know about it. And then in Boulder's Gate, obviously, um, especially, I can't remember Boulder's Gate as much, but Boulder's Gate 2, it was very much like you were kind of, it was all about reincarnations and stuff and this idea of like you were important and these mm. people are, were important in the past life and now it's like you kind of get thrust into roles based on lineage mm. whereas um, not to give too much away uh, Pillars of Eternity has a kind of a similar thing this idea of like you're important um, but you also like maybe know lots of things but you don't know them yet uh, and you, you mm. might, will find them out as you go on. It does a lot of that wonderful thing of um, letting you write the, the history of your character in dialogue as well, just sort of, you know, you select dialogue options and so people are like, so where, where are you from? And you're like, all right, I get to choose. Uh, like, you know, so you, you could select one, all right, that's part of the history of my character now. Or I was lying. So yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it it's actual does, role playing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. And it, I found it amazingly, wonderful thing. it got me with the role playing element so much mm. in the fact that you know, there's that thing at the start of a... And I mean, I always get this in, like, Skyrim and stuff. It's like, oh, what part of uh, this land are you from? Are you one of the sea folk? Are you one of the field tenders? Are you a warrior? And you just sort or of go... are you a lizard person? And really, yeah, you're just <laughs> looking at the little pluses and minuses that come with those things. Or maybe, you know, you just yeah, straight up want to be a like, lizard yeah, person. I can breathe underwater and I'm immune to poison. Yeah. But I look like that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, precisely. So. <laughs> so it's sort of a trade-off between the aesthetic and the mechanics. Always yeah, a yeah. Catwoman. Yeah. yeah. Always been Khajiit. Khajiit for life. Yeah. But um, it gave me a whole selection of, like, different types of human I could be, just in terms of, like, <laughs> where I'm from in the world. Mm. And I just chose one that I thought, yeah, that look, they look looks quite cool. And then surprised myself to find that um, I then got so into, like, the geography of the world, not from going to places, but just from talking to people mm. and talking about the history of where they live and where they come from and all these things, that when, for the first time, there was a conversation and I thought, oh, they're talking about the place where my character's from. It then had the choice for me to be like, oh, yeah, I'm, fr I'm from there. I got really excited just to be like, yeah, I'm from there. And I really want to know more about where I was from. Yeah, It gets me interested in the lore of a world in a way that most games, um, I'd always assume that I just didn't care about that ever again because I, whenever, like, you know, I play in Skyrim and it's like, oh, it's a bookshelf. It's like you start opening books. I'm like, fuck that. I'm not reading a book. I'm yeah, not reading yeah. a book. Whereas in this, it's like I'm just reading the books because I want to know... I want to fill in the gaps. I always got mm. curious about the because I was I try to try to, I like trying to role play in games because yeah. mm. it's fun, 
And uh, in Skyrim, I was trying, and Oblivion too, I was trying to roleplay as a Khajiit, but yeah. there wasn't very much information about what Khajiit <laughs> were like or what they did. Yeah, and very yeah. occasionally you'd meet another one, and every time I met another Khajiit, I'd be like, please give me some dialogue about where we're from and what we do and what our customs are and everything. And they'd just be like, they'd say some, like a phrase, and then it would just be the normal default dialogue yeah and yeah. i know it's expecting far too much to be fair of the game to literally tailor it to every one of 12 races you would but expect I was cat people to have some kind of language though or yeah. some, some kind of secret handshake some kind of cockney rhyme and slang just I something just, I, in my in my mind i wanted there to be a whole separate separate sub quest line for the cat people yeah, you have to yeah. find it feels talking like talking to the other ones and it just it never does it, the thing that disappointed me about even though I really liked it what disappointed me about Skyrim is it really felt like a one size fits all this world is here for you mm. it yeah. didn't feel like the world was really there it was just like conjured by your own no. it was like some. it's like you had a benevolent god just laying out things for you to play with it before everywhere you went I get like, what you mean. Didn't and feel like the world existed independently of your influence. And I think that's why I can can never be asked reading books and games like that because it's trying to create a backstory for a place which is nothing more than jog free, really. But then it does it really toys. well. It does yeah. it really well. Like I mean, I think that Morrowind was a lot better, but in Skyrim especially, it was Morrowind just this... was wait. That's one of the reasons Morrowind was so much better is because it had a world that felt like it existed out with you and out mm. with what you're doing. Mm. That's weird as well. And that's absolutely it had like, race totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Morrowind does feel like. Um, it exists with, without you there, despite the fact that like you know there's no NPC schedules, there's no there's no yeah. what, what do they call it radiant AI, there's none of that. Like you, uh, Morrowind NPCs in the towns and stuff, where the first place you meet them is the place they will always be for for the for the entire six hundred yeah. hours you play that game, <laughs> they will be standing there, rain or shine, dark or light. You know, it would be like. Um, it, it, in Oblivion and in Skyrim, they, they obviously make these attempts to make the world feel alive. Oh, but somehow, like, where's that prick? Something. Where's that prick? Is, yeah. he, is he in bed? Where is he? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that illustrates that is the attitude to Skuma in all the different games. Skuma's yeah. like the heroine of the Skyrim yeah, world, yeah, yeah. of the of the Elder Scrolls world, right? And in Morrowind, if you were carrying Skuma, yeah. Some people just would not talk to you. Like, it was straight up bias. Like, it was prejudice yeah. against drug users. It was probably, like, you're a junkie. Yeah, it was like, fucking, get away from me, a fucking junkie. Yeah. And then, um, but then in Oblivion, it didn't really matter. Yeah. And then in Skyrim, Skuma didn't even do anything. Yeah. Like, in Oblivion, you at least had Skuma dens and people who would, like, rove the countryside, like, dealing and stuff. You at least had some kind of presence of the drug. And then in Skyrim, I mean, it was explained away a little bit because it would be like, oh, the Skuma's well weak up here kind of thing but in, yeah. in the north we don't really do skooma but it was like it didn't really do anything to you as a character where skooma used to give you you know addiction used to give you massive benefits like drugs used to in the fallout world as well yeah and yeah. i f- i just feel like it's sort of pussy well out a bit. i think that's um that's probably to do with ratings and stuff i, I mean, think so yeah like games it's, were it's less, to do with them yeah. Um, yeah it's to do with not having anything that's a drug you take know, the, the drug picture take the syringe off that box exactly and not having the peggy rating it's and right it's to probably have the big to do with not, not upsetting anyone as well i yeah. guess but I just felt like that was one of the things that made me feel like Morrowind existed is that mm. if you were running around carrying skimmer people people just wouldn't talk to you I completely get about where you this idea of things existing just for you that and I felt like uh, a lot of time it, it's just about like create amazing architecture like for example oh, in Skyrim, yeah. you hear about the Mages Guild or whatever you hear it, and then you get there and you see it and that is like that's replaced there's still amazing moments in it like that no, no, but that's instead of the history and instead of really believing about the history of the Mages Guild it's just the grandeur of discovery and finding place and that's awesome but what I love and I think why a lot of these um, old games always have the trick of either it being about lineage or being about immortality or being about um, uh, fate about this idea of like you are destined to do this and you're, like, you're locked into a path and things are going to happen to you um, is it allows the world it gives you a reason to care about the backstory and I mean I don't know how true it is but I get this feeling with Pillars of Eternity because it's a story about destiny in a way and a story about things when you're reading about these these like lore of what happened before you kind of think this is going to be important at some point you don't feel like you're wasting time because Mm. you feel like these stories are going to be a part of your story even though they happened a while ago yeah and i love that that you don't feel like whereas in lots of games it's like oh remember who the king who lived here 600 years ago it's like will this ever be relevant to anything in this game no but we spent a long time writing it's like (laughs) gone like yeah we had four people employed to write these backstories (laughs) because people like reading the books in these games (laughs) and it's like they don't i don't think people do it's just i did but then i'm a massive nerd i think you do 
I don't know. I, I you, maybe you I do, actually but... bought the special Titan Books anthology of Skyrim lore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they just came out. It was like the uh, it's the collected freaking stupid books of the of the Elder Scrolls worlds. Really? So like, yeah, in, in an actual. I bought that. I bought that. I've been mean, reading it a little bit. Is it any good? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I do like it. It's alright, you've answered that question already. <laughs> you answered it. Elder Scrolls is a weird one. I think I think to be a fan of Elder Scrolls you have to let a lot of bullshit pass over you. You, you do have entirely, to yeah. Intentionally not see the strings, I think. Because like as games as well, you can you know, we were talking earlier with Broken Age about how you, you can start to see the codes when you're you know, about when you're trying to get something to trigger. Yeah. Like you you can quite easily slip into that with a with a Elder Scrolls game because mm. they, they feel very it's a weird criticism of a game but they feel very video gamey rather than because rather than you know being a world it was, yeah it but, was uh, I mean I've got a theory about Bethesda games where you basically you get one yeah and then the next one you played is a pale no matter what it is it's a pale imitation of your first experience I think that's why your suspension um, of disbelief was stronger I feel mm-hmm. like that applies to Oblivion, Fallout Three, Skyrim. Like I, the first one of those, or more when the first one that you played really sticks with you. The others don't so much. I totally agree with. I that. honestly feel like that is the exact reason why um, New Vegas got such a bad rap. I think mm. it was too soon after Three, and it had a lot of the same problems as Three and more because obviously it was a shaky end just to begin with, and Obsidian mm-hmm. have a tendency to just see how far they can get this baby going, and they just cranked it full of loads of crazy stuff. Mm. I thought. Um, New Vegas was a fantastic game. Loved it. I thought of New Vegas was much but it better was than Fallout 3. Yeah, really badly so received. So much less bland, but it mm. was critically very bad. I think it was just too soon. People were like, it was too soon after Fallout 3, and people, because I tried to play it straight away, and I was like, not interested in this. Went back to it about two years later. Loved it. Mm. I couldn't get into Fallout 3 because I was such a huge nerd about the first two Fallout games, like you, right? Yeah, but I managed I, to I couldn't get, into get past that. Yeah, I managed to play the first 15 hours of it twice. Mm. I was upset. <laughs> I was very upset about lots of things being changed. Yeah, mm. I was. Yeah, maybe it just wasn't as adult, and that comes back that to the, it, the, yeah. the, the, the games now are being observed a lot more, and you cannot have games like Fallout Two anymore, where it's just like, sure, it's got like loads of prostitution and drugs. Yeah, and... that is yeah, because you you end up not being able to sell your game through key retailers and so on and yeah. so forth. But things like um, in America, it becomes a religious issue. Yeah, like it's mental. It makes sense that a company like Bethesda would tone that shit down. And it's not necessarily the thing is like I feel the same. I felt the same about Fallout Three as I did about Dark Souls Two, in that I was aware it was amazing. It just wasn't quite right for me. And yeah. it's like it's still, it's a bad version of an amazing series. Like it's still better than most games. It just wasn't didn't feel quite right. Mm. I felt like Dark Souls 2 didn't feel quite right even though it was really good and I was enjoying it and it was the same with Fallout 3 and so I think that yeah sometimes you just have weird personal hang-ups about what, what a game series should be yeah I think yeah. that's fine that's allowed I think it is I think it's just that it's just a tendency as, as you say to try and um, fixate on the mindset of going this just isn't for me rather than being like it's not as good it's not I, as good and everyone <laughs> who thinks it's good is an idiot no, I, may, I make a real effort not to do that anymore and just yeah. to avoid that kind of tendency to get riled up by video games not being what I want and just, just be able to yeah. smile and be like listen you bastards <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got something to listen and you codswallops better listen up real good I had a really good reviews editor at IGN uh, called Dan Stapleton who used to basically every time you wrote the game is this or uh, you do this he'd mm. be like change it to first person so it's I felt the game was this or I did this or this happened to me and he said then people can't argue with it because mm. at that point you're just saying what happened to you no one can argue with that if you say the game is if you say that the, the game is really grey looking then someone can argue with that if you said I thought the game was really no one can argue that you thought well, that that's true but I actually I got given the opposite advice and I, I still own that advice because I think you're right it avoids arguments but my attitude for that is fuck it, own it. Like, <laughs> like as far as I'm concerned, it's like tell people what they will experience when they. Yeah, I, f- I feel like that's also completely valid. And but no, you do. You he, do get he, was quite, he was quite hardline on the on reviews. He was like your review is, and he always like made it a personal. Every time you made a definitive statement, he'd make it a personal one. I feel like that's not necessarily every time, but I certainly learned something from it. If you have a, I mean, especially for an online publication which has to deal with lots of comments, that makes sense. But back when I used to write for OXM. I enjoy the fact that you would write the defi- you would write definitive reviews. You take hard line. You'd say this is this. When you play this, you will feel like this, and yeah. you just had to rely on the feeling that you really were getting it really right. Yeah, <laughs> obviously still, you don't I always still, get it right though. I still but... write like that when I write like a review for Edge or yeah. whatever. But when I write for Kotaku, I mean we do mostly kind of first person 
Because then it's just, it's just the style. But I still do this and I still get into trouble with it. And it's funny, actually. I see people um, saying, I get this a lot. I see people saying, I really like Matt and when he talks about games, but it kind of frustrates me because he always, like, he says that things are, like, really good. As, like, he always says things as if they're facts, you know? And he never says, like, it's my opinion that this game is good. He always oh, says, this Jesus. game is great. Fucking and it's like, boring people. It's, it's incredibly boring, but it's this thing of being like, is it not a given that everything I say is my opinion? Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, it's like... <laughs> the way you have to phrase things now to oh, avoid being pilloried is insane. Like people, we've had this argument, like, on a loop for... How, however long the internet has existed, but that's just your opinion. Well, yeah, it's my opinion. It I said it. Like so my opinion is my truth. Like you've got you yours. Get the it's fine. That there's like it, it's like it's like every, loads but of I, people just haven't caught up. But the, the problem is, there's still this large group of people that believes there exists like a kind of Plato esque ideal of fact and truth, and that mm. we're all just trying to find, it, even though that isn't actually at all true. No. Like that there exists the truth and the real and the correct and the objective and that everything you say is kind of supposed to yeah, yeah. be striving towards that. Of and course. I think a lot of people have abandoned that now, but there's still a big contingent of people who I mean, I, I literally just made a massive video about this exact yeah. topic, <laughs> uh, which if you want to watch, you can. It's called, I think it's, uh, should we keep politics out of games? The question mark as a way of teasing people in, in the hope of like ensnaring a few people who think that's a really good idea and then maybe try and turn them around to it. I'll quickly talk about a something I played. It's not out yet, but I played a kind of beta version of it. It's called Poncho. It's coming out soon. It's kind of a side-scrolling platformer slash puzzlier. Mm. Um, at first, it's very much borrows a bit from Fez in terms of like, uh, it doesn't have the twistiness. It has three planes, uh, which you can jump between by using the triggers on the controller. So you can be like moving to the foreground, the background, but it has that kind of Fez style thing if you use them to then walk behind things, jump through and um, do like get through air sections. At first it was quite pedestrian, quite nice. It's very relaxed. It's got that lovely like uh, same thing of Fez in terms of having like quite nice world design. It's not quite on par in terms of the art design of Fez, which was just top mm -hmm. notch. It's got lovely music. Um, and it has got a bit more emphasis on story, but it still also has that kind of occasionally a bit like mind-blowing Earth 2001 style like what the hell is this like like grandeur mm. um, I'm enjoying it but I've played it for about an hour I don't know when it's coming out but it's coming out on Vita and PS4 and a bunch of other stuff as well um, I kind of found for myself it was this thing of being like, it's quite pedestrian to begin with and I was like where's this going um, because there isn't as much scope for puzzles in Poncho as there is yes. in Fez yeah, yeah. Um, because of the nature of it but it means it is a bit more about platforming and uh, I got about, after about an hour and a half, I got to the point where I was like, yeah, this is just basically, it's like platforming, but in another dimension as well of having to jump on platforms at the right time. And I just found that a bit frustrating. But if you're into cute pixely platformers and don't mind difficulty on that front, then keep an eye out for that because it is quite lovely. Love that shit, all um, over it, brilliant. But I found it a bit like, oh, are you expecting me to shift planes whilst jumping on platforms? Like, I was just like, I'm... I'm too tired and old. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Um, but that's another thing I've noticed recently is that that shift of being like you start playing a game, it's got lovely music, lovely graphics, seems quite gentle. You go, is this going to be a lovely, gentle game I can enjoy at my own pace? Or is yeah. it just doing it for 40 minutes and then Ori being the like... Forest. Yeah, I think Ori's going to get one. quite hard. It's quite difficult. But um, I mean... I hear I've not played it. Yeah, Ori's difficulty is I'm more on my street. It, it has like massive difficulty spikes. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, because when when uh, uh, video gamer were playing, it was Tom that was doing the review, but every two minutes he was at one point he was kept coming in and getting he would get like Brett to come through and do this bit, <laughs> and there was one particular bit where Brett couldn't do it, so he got Dave to do it, and then Steve couldn't do it, and I think it, every I single one of us had had a pop at one point. I kind of missed that kind of that used to happen when I was working on magazines. Yeah, like yeah. someone would just be because you had to review a game in a day, you know, you didn't have any time. Yeah. And so you get stuck on something, you just call somebody, you you'd step out of the games room and just yell at the office, can someone help me with this bullshit game, please? <laughs> that was really good fun. <clears throat> I used to love reviewing really, when they got really bad games that come out all the time. Was it Sacred 2 where you're a pirate? Yeah. I was oh, like, I had to come back in and go, good. I'm stuck because instead of spending all of my money on better sword moves, which I need, I spent all of my money on a monkey and I don't know what it does. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like this thing of being like, this game is absolute bullshit, but I'm having a whale of time playing it knowing that after I've done this for another five or six hours, I won't ever have to do it ever again. Yeah. Um, so I do miss... I, so, I kind of miss the, the, the self-discipline challenge of having to play shit games properly. 
yeah. or just to review them. Because now if I think something shit, I tend to just stop. Just yeah. not play it anymore. And you, you kind of miss the... I miss the comedy you used to extract from the pain. It's true there'd be more games. There's no point giving coverage to things that are just really bad. You might as well yeah. just go and play something better. And there's nothing that amusingly bad. Like, it's not like... I mean, often if you're playing something that's really bad, it's like an indie game now. And there's no... No one's, like, pre-ordered it. You're not serving anyone by saying this indie game you've not heard of isn't very good, generally. You're not yeah. helping anyone by saying that. I guess the thing is, back in the day, like, um, when you played a bad game, it was often great because you still had to review it anyway. You were, you were set in motion, so you'd just be able to use it as a springboard for incredibly witty writing yeah, uh, yeah which is the same Jesus, thing is true excuse. now it's just that people now use it as a kind of uh springboard for just injecting youtuber style personality on top of it and going oh look how shit this game is i yeah. just think as is always the way things back then were a little bit more highbrow blah, 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 perhaps blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> just a little uh, weren't we better i never want to play a shit game again i had to play bound by flame oh it's not very good and, uh, oh, it's, it's it is the <laughs> worst not very good it's it's terrible. It's just, it's it's offensive. It's just everything terrible about video games. It's funny. There's this thing where like, I think because lots of people just watch YouTubers playing shit games for like yeah. quick clicks and just playing something for an hour, making a funny video about how shit something is, and then moving on. You get a lot of term podcasts. You get um, young people saying, "Oh, what's the worst game you ever played?" As if it's like just this universally funny thing. These people don't appreciate the actual pain of having to review something. Yeah which is terrible. Having to invest like 20 hours of your life yeah. in something, which... Systems which hate you. Yeah. Systems which yeah, just... Like, games that just have literally no concession to your went mental well-being. It's all just fun and not... games if you just play it for yeah. 20 minutes yeah. and walk I, away. I pulled an old nighter to get that out of the way because I had other stuff to do that week. And it's just like... It if you're trying to be fair hard. as well, you've got to play something properly. Yeah, yeah. Just try to play it properly. When I was a baby journalist on a magazine, I got given all the shit games. Yeah. I played so <laughs> many... What was it called? Te- tequila Overdrive or something? It was a even... terrible, like, Mexican-themed GTA starring a white guy. It was the worst. I played Beat Down Fists of Vengeance, which was an unplayable Capcom side-scrolling 3D fighter. That From the work. title alone. Like, so bad. Four out of ten. So It was a three out of ten. <laughs> it was so bad. Close, close. close. I so give a half bad. a point for that. <laughs> and just all, all these games, like, the, the kind of mid early to mid PS2 era this was mm-hmm. so there were a lot of broken games that didn't work properly yeah, I got yeah. all of them and the, the sheer pain I experienced oh, uh, yeah. poor me having to review video games for a living as a teenager but you know <laughs> people, it, it was actually quite annoying people that don't they though in, in the sort of in the PS2 era there was a lot of shit that didn't work yeah and it didn't get a day one patch because that system didn't exist so no. your broken yeah. game was broken forever. forever. If anything, though, that was better because I mean you didn't have to constantly qualify it and think, is this going to suddenly be fixed as soon as yeah, it's launched? Yeah. It was um, still wasn't as bad as being a door to door salesperson, which was my worst, no, worst I had, job. I had a terrible time trying to tell people about Nokia phone on the street. <laughs> I was selling educational books in San Diego. It's important for everyone to have one really bad job. Yeah, I, I remember just uh, crying by myself behind a wheelie bin on a suburban street at one point and being like, I'm never going to do this again. And that's enough about Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, now it's time for some questions. First of all, we've got a question from Charlie Humphreys, who says, right. I thought this would be a good one. Wonderful name, it Charlie is. Humphreys. Charlie Humphreys. Sounds very respectable. Uh, it does. It says, any thoughts on the best game to play as a parent slash guardian and child? I thought this is this is... Haven't we answered this a lot of times? We probably have, but have you got any any I've got wild some new suggestions? Ones. Okay. I've got some new ones because uh, I've got fed up with my partner's child only ever playing things with guns in. Uh, we played some, some Star Wall. Now? Yeah, we played Star Wall, which is basically swords. If you don't know what Star Wall is, it is a game where you are big neon coloured narwhals with special pulsating hearts on your chests, and you have to pierce each other's narwhal hearts with your big narwhal noses. That's fencing. Yeah, fencing with, whales. fencing with well, yeah, fencing with underwater creatures, which is great. Um, it's got really silly controls as well. You like wibble all around. It's it's good. It's like, uh, but not silly enough that it's uncontrollable. So that's been fun. Uh, some more. This is things for all th- all three of us play. Some gang beasts been very entertaining. Really oh, fun to play gang. with. A, I've with never kids. played it with children. Well, I played it with Chris Bratt, but um, <laughs> I had to get one in there. <laughs> um, yeah, Gang Beast is incredible. So fun. It's brilliant. Really it's fun so with uh, with with kids. I, we played some Nidhogg. Yeah. Um, which Nidhogg's may or may not bit. be. It's not well. It would, okay, depending on what that kid plays and sees, it's not particularly violent. But no, you know, it isn't violent. Your it's mileage just complicated. 
it's, it's actually pretty easy to understand. He can give me a run for my money, which is impressive. Yeah, that's what I'd be worried about. I'd be worried about playing with kids. Like, because you don't minutes, know what they're going to be do. Because they don't really have tactics. They just do stuff. So with an adult, you tend to read what they're going to do and you learn their pattern. With a kid, they just do random shit all the time. So mm. Nitog has been fun. Good challenge. Uh, I've tried really, really hard for about four years to play Zelda together, but it's just not happening. It's not going to happen. I think I might have to You, can't, you can't imprint it onto your kids. No, or it's really Or other people's sad. kids or anyone's. You have to just accept that these things it's are not It's not got enough time. guns for him. It's depressing. It's like, he thinks <laughs> Nintendo's for babies. Nintendo is for babies, Keza. <sighs> anyway... Jim, <laughs> <laughs> you got any suggestions? Uh, I was trying to think of games I've actually played with my kid. Apart, I mentioned Broken Age earlier, but that's not really. That's what I wish my stepson would play that with me. Yeah, he'd be like, "This is boring. Nothing's dying. <laughs> Nothing's dying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's dying. Therefore, I am. <laughs> I'm not stimulated." <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a terrible indictment of our times, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, uh, well, they're massively into Minecraft, and you know what they're massively into at the moment is Wolf Dave, that little yeah. weird sort of Spectrum game that popped up on PS4. I've played oh, that. Yeah. Um, they With loved the that. collecting. Yeah, it looks, sort of, like, looks like original Mario Bros. Where you yeah, yeah, on and it's got a sim. Yeah, it's uh, original yeah. Mario Bros. With kind of. Uh, I was going to say the like Super Mario Two combat system. <laughs> no, <laughs> combat system. <laughs> what they've done is they've used the picking too. stuff up and chucking it. It's, it's basically a combination of the original Mario Bros. and yeah. Super Mario Bros. And you've got too. like power blocks and stuff in it as well. Yes, you? exactly. Because I've played yeah. that and it's got a surprisingly dark um, game over screen. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's really weird. <laughs> I, think it's, it's, I think it's done by the Bit Trip guys. Um, uh, I think it's got some crossover characters anyway, but uh, they 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 absolutely love that. I played that with them, and it's just insane um, blocks of color that I I it was taking me like seconds to figure out what was going on. By the time I'd figured out what was happening, something else was happening. So I was playing it in a different time zone to my kids, <laughs> so that they were obviously beating me. Um, but it was it, it was really fun. It was just like this mental button bashing. And I was looking at them. And I was like, "You're not just you're not just frantically hitting things. You're actually doing stuff. You know what yeah. you're doing." But they're screaming as well. So it's just like that's in, not fair. Like <laughs> it's such an assault on the senses, and they're like, "Ah!" Is this um, gonna be like the new Oculus Rift? Like yeah. having <laughs> James Cade screaming in your ears? Yeah, yeah. I might I might do a video actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, Woe Wo Dave. For some reason, my kids love it. Maybe yours will too. It's got great so, music, Woe Dave, actually. Yeah. I mean, it's a very simple game. They but do we, pick up on random things. I remember um, my partner's kid, when he was like five, he got really into this game that was on the iPad. I don't know why it was on there, but I think it was called Mr. Kobayashi, but it was a game in which a little sprite pixel Japanese businessman mm. was trying to commit suicide. Yeah. And it was a puzzle game where essentially you had to figure out how to get him dead. Like, <laughs> and he he, he got because well, I kind of wasn't looking. It was just like a pixely platformer. It looked like it. And then I watched him play it for a while, and I was like, "This is really dark." And after a while, he turned around. He was like, "Kaza, why does the man always have to die?" <laughs> <laughs> and this is why he now yeah. needs guns. This, this is an example. I think he's just a normal, you know, nine-year-old no, boy. I think that's unfortunately, how it but, works. Yeah. But he um he just has this fascination with uh, with anything like gory and violent. Morbid, it just happens. Yeah. But it's it's funny because. Uh, it just kind of illustrates how they pick up on just random games. Like yeah. now, unfortunately, I feel like for him and his friends, YouTube is a huge influence on what. Like, they all play Five Nights at Freddy's, which would have shitted me right up when I was nine. Mm. But you know, they all play whatever YouTube tells them to play now, like mm. which is a bit depressing. But then yeah. I guess I played when Sixty Four Magazine told me to play. So, is it that different? Well, it was N sixty four games were really expensive. Yeah. Mm. So you kind of couldn't play them without. Permission from your parents, yeah. The, yeah. Your parents had to buy it for you. Unless you were, yeah. I mean, there must have been kids out there who were walking around with sixty pounds in cash in their pocket, but I certainly didn't know any of them. <laughs> that is true, yeah. Um, it, took, it took weeks of begging. You'd have to prime it. You'd have to yeah, be like, to so buy, like, there's this game called Smash Corpse, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, used, a, I remember I just because I called it Smash Corpse, Smash so Corpse. I always will call it Smash Corpse <laughs> because I didn't understand that core. I mean, I can't expect kids Blast to. Corpse. That's cool. That's the one. That's it. That's it's cool. a stupid quirk of language, though, isn't it? It's got a P in it. Yeah, it should be. Oh, English. You can't expect that. kids who like robots and smashing buildings to also know about French. I Jesus. used to have to. My parents weren't very keen on games, so yeah, I used to have to, to do presentations. Basically, I would do. 
I basically would sit in the conservatory with mum and dad and like sit them down aged eight just mm. sit them down and be like mum I really want Banjo-Kazooie here are all the facts yeah. like, and I'd like bore them to tears after 40 minutes they'd be like fine we'll get you Banjo-Kazooie please Mine shut would, up yeah. just yeah. shut up about it I wasn't allowed violent games no I, I had none um, I started to buy my own violent games when I was probably about 14, 15. Same, yeah. But up until that point, I wasn't allowed them. I really lucked out, actually, and I've probably already told this story before, but when I was a kid, uh, my parents, both quite religious, still are. Um, they're not, like, annoying about it, which is good. But I got, um, when I was like, I had my baptism quite late. I must have been about nine or something. Not a confirmation, but a baptism. Uh, no, yeah. Oh. I think it was, like, uh, when I was, like, seven or eight or something. Anyway, I got, um, I was allowed to have, like, a Mega Drive game. Oh, and, wow. But also because wow. my parents were like, well, you know, you're, you're not having any games that are not nice. I got bought the Mickey and Donald, uh, like Castle, not Castle, Castle Vision, not the other one. World of Illusion with Mickey and Donald, which I lucked out so much because a game like that at that time it could have so easily been like the worst thing in the world, but it ended up being incredible. I still want to go back and play that. It was one of the best co-op games I've ever played. Anyway, another question. Mm. Um, William Reed says, if the next prime minister was decided via a video game face-off. Which game would they have to play? We've yeah. been doing a version of this on Kotaku UK all week. <laughs> You've been doing The Sims, right? Yeah. yeah. We've put all the president, presidential, all the uh, all the candidates of the main parties in, firstly, Pez. So we did a Pez tournament oh, okay. with all the main parties. And then we did The Sims, which just got very absurd very quickly. Miliband had an affair with Nick Clegg. It, got, it, it went a bit crazy. It does tend to do that. Yeah. And then we got WWE tomorrow, which will be fun. But if we're talking like a face-off, I think Nidhogg shows nerves... Tactics. I'd say mount your friends or nothing. Oh, God, mm. yeah, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> just because it's the most intense, I love masculine experience. And uh, yeah. that's what I like to see in, in, in leaders. What was that really... really uh, what was that? <laughs> I can't keep a straight face or something. <laughs> <laughs> what was that really bleak uh, nuclear tactics game? Defcon 5, Def Con. it called? Just called Defcon, yeah, I think. to play that. Defcon. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy <laughs> 3. <laughs> Yeah, get him to play that and then tell him it's whoever wins <clears throat> and then uh, at the end just be like, no, he just wants to watch you, he just wants to see how you behave. And like, yeah, yeah. You're awful, you just nuked everyone. Not letting you run the country. Yeah, no way, you just nuked everyone, you nutter. You just nuked Luxembourg, they never hurt anyone. <laughs> um, Luke Summerhays, good little question here. Were you ever stringently fanboyish of one brand or console and do you regret it? Yes, massively, massively. Huge Nintendo kid. Like I used to. Nintendo's call it. for kids, though. Well, yeah, well, I, I, grew out, I grew out of it when I was eleven. No, sorry, like, for babies. Yeah, for babies or for gays. There's another thing he said, which I told him off for. I was like, "Come <laughs> on, that's not fair. You can't say Nintendo's gay. That's that's ridiculous." It's he not. Did I mean, apologize. He also, apologized. Mean, frankly, Japanese can be not very progressive in that in that <laughs> front in their game design. So, uh, but I was I was a huge Nintendo fan girl until I was probably about eleven or twelve. I used to literally call it the Grey Station and stuff. I was proper wow. playground angry about it and. Uh, yeah, and I had to describe it. See, as a Sega guy, I was never really that attached. I could always kind of tell that Sega was a bit crap. <laughs> I was like, I had a Mega Drive, but I kind of wanted a I SNES. was mega fanatical, but I was a child, you know? And also internet comments didn't exist. So I don't really regret it, because it had no negative effects. Um, I was very pro N64, and I didn't like the PlayStation. I bought a, uh, I bought an Xbox when I was... Four, well, I got an Xbox when I was about 14, and then I bought a PS2 very shortly afterwards. So that, that was like the vestiges of it. But yeah, mm. I, I don't regret it because I didn't do anything bad. I really enjoyed the sense of belonging that it that it, that being a fan yeah. person engendered, and it was fun playground stuff, and no yeah. one was ever mean about it, and I wasn't ever horrible to people. So no, I don't regret it. No knife fights. Mm. No, <laughs> <laughs> over over <laughs> knife fights over banjo kazooie. No, yeah, that that's not happen. what Rare wanted, is it? No. I think that's. How about definitely. you, Jim? I uh, I had it with the Amiga. Yeah. And I was one. I was one of the people who. I, mean, I was a kid as well, obviously, but I was, I was one of the people who, like, stuck with the Amiga until long after its original creators had died. So, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, you know, the, the, it, it, that sense of belonging was was amazing with the Amiga because you know the, a lot of the magazines kept going and you, you felt like a sort of embattled yeah. subculture. Amiga was, power was like. Yeah. Religious, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yes. yeah. Following, and, and we all, everyone knew it was destined to die at some point. But it was just like, no, it's the best machine. And uh, even like I, the the Amiga twelve hundred I had was ridiculous. By the time I got rid of it, it was like it had been expanded. It had like eight mega RAM, which was unheard of for an Amiga. Um, and uh, you know, a hard disk, a CD-ROM drive. You know, it it it, it was it was 
a, a lovely machine. Loved it actually. I think I still would if I still had it. Um, I do kind of regret it because it, it. I think I think that's what's made me really partial to lost causes. And I think, uh, <laughs> well, I know that's being Scottish. Uh, <laughs> that's done that for you. Basically, yeah. I've always just enjoyed being a sport. vulture. Mm. I, I I've been very behind things at times. I was very into the PS2. I was very into the Xbox 360. You know, when I've got a console, mm-hmm. I loved it. Now I'm, I really like my PS4, but I'm not ever really partisan about one brand or another. You were a Sega guy, though, right, when you were little? I was a Sega guy up to a point, actually. We had a Mega Drive, and mm-hmm. I liked it, but I always kind of knew there were lots of other games on the SNES, and I liked playing yeah. the SNES as well. I think most most children do have this instinctive I'm X and you are Y reaction to almost anything. We had like, a thing where we swapped, or... like a uh, kid across the road, he had a SNES and I had a Mega Drive, and we had for a period... Uh, for maybe a month we just both swapped and, and that was great because awesome, we yeah. both got to play all of the games that we couldn't play and my dad was convinced that plugging the, the SNES into the TV had somehow broken it like because the skull wasn't quite right after it or something which is madness it's like you know it's this equivalent of HDMI cables being better if they're made of gold or something yeah. but um, yeah no so I guess we can't have been that fanboyish if we were willing to swap because that would have to do a swap like that would have like that implied that that the other console was worth having. Whereas That's true, yeah. for a lot of kids, you'd be like, why thing. would I want your fucking shit snares? Like, <laughs> I've got a Mega Drive. It's the best games console. on. It's got the most powerful graphics chip. Like, yeah. it's like, it's got blast processing. That's a stupid kind of yeah. conversation you used to be encouraged to have, especially by, I used to read the official magazine when I was, you know, seven, eight. Yeah. Which at that point used to, it basically was, I mean, it was so immature. It was, it was four little children. You know, and it, it was it got to this point where it got like really combative with the PlayStation. It had like jokes to tell your PlayStation owning friends and stuff, and it had this whole like whole tribal thing going on, and it really stoked it. And I think when I when I started growing out of it was when I kind of switched magazines. Mm-hmm. And start, I started reading multi format magazines and stuff. And yeah, yeah. There was certainly a period when I was maybe eight nine when it was very important to me. I think I was kind of adamant the that I'd made a better choice with the N sixty four than the PlayStation. But that was probably just because I invested so much money and I had no other choice. Yeah, but that's it as well. Like... It's not defensible, I'm afraid, Matt, at all. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but there were some fantastic games on it. Yeah, I would was. still say the N64 was as good as the PlayStation. You know what, I, I think actually I had a better childhood with the N64 than I would have done with the PlayStation. Yeah, I yeah. think that the PlayStation had better games and for actually people maybe five years older than me. Yeah, if you're a teenager yeah. you wanted the PlayStation yeah. on The PlayStation would have taught you about real human conflict, I think. <laughs> I'm intrigued by this. Well, is yeah. this why is this why I'm such a sheltered man child <laughs> <laughs> on the couch with Jim? I think Matt, if you hadn't had a N64, this, well, the this is the first time I've heard that though. Like a friend of mine once told me that I was that I was broken on the inside because I'd grown up on lovely, fluffy, happy Nintendo, which I think is the <laughs> opposite of true. <laughs> hey, listen, N64 Body Harvest. That game was hard as fucking dick. Yeah, yeah. And hard as dick. Hard as dick. That's a new <laughs> phrase. I quite like it. <laughs> And also, I mean, how hard is that? It depends. <laughs> depends anyway, on age and yeah. situation, um, Wolfgang Morgenstern asks, will any of you be at any big gaming conventions this year, and why not? That assumes no, which I assume some of us will. You're probably going to be three, right? Nope. No. Staying home, building blanket forts, getting pizza, covering it at home. Nice. Um, with my team. It's going to be mm. fun. What about you? I'm not going to E3. I will be... Um, we figured out last year that it would be a lot easier to cover E3 as the video team from the house. That's... Pretty much what I found. We yeah. couldn't even watch the conferences when we were actually in LA. I mean, that, that was like, that was the great irony. They were happening like that's you it. know, that's what I found. Yards away, went, yeah. we much watch easier them. to cover E3 when you're not there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, I won't be. There will be a team from Video Gamer there, obviously, but uh, we will be going to GD, uh, GDC. Gamescom. Gamescom. Yes. Me too. Gamescom so, is better. It's more manageable. I wouldn't miss Gamescom for the world now. Been to nine. I love Gamescom. I love Germany too. So that kind of. <clears throat> I tend to spend an extra week in Germany afterwards. Then. It's great. Magic. Yeah, I probably won't be going to any of them because I just don't. I tend to go to a lot of board gaming conventions now because I am a cool dude. Board gaming conventions do sound nice though. Well, there's just it's different. The clientele must right? be a bit different. Um, it's it's a variety of things. Uh, clientele is different, but it's it's a. Uh, it's a not likely until it's bad. It's just there's a lot of them. E three or Gamescom. Yeah, it's different, right? You've got like um, it's less a lot less corporate to begin with. Like, of course, there's there's less money in it, but there's there is money in it. It's a lot less corporate. You've got a lot more people who are just there to play games and meet people and play games with them. And it's less about the news and it's more about like people getting together and playing 
Uh, you get a really nice atmosphere, and you get lots of like families going and stuff, and it's 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 very different. Oh, it's like kind it. of sweet. I like it a lot. You get to meet lots of nice people. You get to play games. You get to play loads of really cool games, and I just love the fact that also I mean, it helps that when we're doing board game stuff, we're there representing Shabbos Sit Down, which is obviously like one of the kind of most important sites in the board gaming like realm realm. Uh, and it's nice because it means you know you you don't have to. It's less of a kind of a fiddle. You know, I can't. Mm. I don't, I'm not wanting to be, it's not about wanting to be self-important, it's not about wanting me to be able to rock up to E3 and have people go, oh, Mr. Lees, we've prepared a special uh, carpet for you, come with us. I don't want that, but I also, <laughs> I can't be asked with the constant uphill of trying to get anything done anywhere because people don't know who you are, and that's fine, but there is so much stuff in the world of video games which is so gated yeah, that um, I just can't be asked with the work of that. I did really enjoy going to E3 with IGN. It of was, course, it was really fun. Then you get the carpets, right? A world away right? from going with my. I mean, I went. I went a few times before. It was a world away going with IGN. Like people just fall over. Yeah, <laughs> it was amazing. You just show me a thing, and they go, yeah, "Oh, of course." Hilarious. And really it used to be fun. a bit like that when I was at official Xbox magazine. People mm. would look after you. Or at the very least, they go, "Oh, I'll go and find out somebody who you can speak to." Mm. But when it's just Matt Lee's, Matt Lee's dot com, it's just like if people don't know who you are, then you're fucked. You, they might go and ask someone, but chances are. You're not on the list, you're not coming in, you're not doing this, and you just want to see stuff. And what I like about board game conventions is the board games are just on tables, you know, yeah, there's very little that, yeah. there's very little behind closed door stuff. Or if there is, people just uh, we usually just naturally get invited to it. So mm. I it's the thing, I don't like the I don't want the ego of being like you're important, but I just like the fact that it's it makes not everything even ego. very easy. That's, it's not even ego, it's just practicality. Yeah. It's just like just being able to do your job properly. <laughs> Which is sometimes quite hard. I'm trying to explain to people what I do is just impossible. They go, who are you? What are you? Oh, I can't. I do sort of videos on the internet. Can I see your video game, please? <laughs> and I do literally say it like that. Um, anyway, finally, Oscar Deus says, given its somewhat fragile nature recently, would you recommend the games industry as an entry to make a career in? Absolutely, yes. It's not fragile. It's fantastic. Like, the games media area is a mess. But that's fine because... It's volatile, not fragile. Well, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's volatile, but it's, it's changing. It's fun. It's changing. It's fun. Video games is a huge market. Um, You're better off on the development side. I yeah. know. Like basically, learn your basic development skills. Learn your, learn how to do Unity and learn how to do your program. Learn that you always have a job. Somewhere. Who is it? Is it Ted from? Uh, I can't remember who it was. It might be a guy from Insomniac who always says like people talk about wanting to get a job in games. You just need to remember that any job you can imagine, there is that in games. Mm. Like so, like you know. You don't need to be the person who designs the game. You don't need to be the person who plays all the games. You can just be someone who's an accountant for a game firm or somebody yeah, who's yeah. a secretary at a game place. Oh, it's like there are so many roles. And working in games is great because you get to work with nice people and you get to work in exciting places with interesting people, mm, even yeah. if you're doing a job which maybe is a bit dull. Do a dull job within cool the world industry. of games. Yeah. In a cool industry, yeah. A dull job in a cool industry is better than dull job in dull industry. Oh, hell yeah. yeah definitely. I did a day of working as a secretary for the Saudi oil industry. I did three days of that. It was the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> it was temp work, but I just ate biscuits and sat on Facebook. I wanted to fucking end it all. <laughs> anyway. That's what I did a video game today. <laughs> That's not true. That's not even true. <laughs> it's a good way to spend most days. You know, it's, I might do it tomorrow. I'd say, as with anything in life, have a plan B. Have a don't, plan B. Don't, like, yeah. don't basically pin all your dreams and hopes on one thing because it might not work out, but that goes and for everything in life. Not also, just your career options. We've talked about, I've talked about it a bit this time, but you know, it actually it is difficult covering games or working within games where you are having to make games, where you're having to constantly analyse them, where you're constantly having to turn the games you play into some form of something, whether it's livelihood, whether it's uh, a funny article, or whether it's a playthrough, whether it's a review, or whether it's just looking for something to write about or talk about or discuss. Actually, it changes the nature of it. And actually, you know, I think we're all quite lucky in the fact that we managed to do that, but still enjoy playing games. But many people don't. Many mm. people end up leaving the industry because yeah, it kills games they just people. lose interest in it. I feel quite bad because th there are a lot of people, and I know because I've met them, who are really really want to get into games media and they read like they, they kind of give it that the people have, have spoken to me as if I'm somehow in charge of it but you know <laughs> people have spoken to me in that way that people speak to Simon Cowell when they're like pleading to oh, stay in no. the competition and it's just like I really want to do it I want to stay in it I want to um you, you know that this is what I want to do and I feel like I'm really made for it and and they asked me how I got into the industry, and I like by accident, 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. almost by accident. Basically, I was doing, I was using video games as an excuse to make jokes about decks and stuff, and then you know, five years later, I've got a job out of it. Um, I, I never at any point in my life have I been like, you know, I really want to work in games. Yeah. Really, and I think, I think it was probably valuable to know that that a lot of people do kind of just fall into it and like, yeah. oh, well, this is what we ended up doing. I did Maybe. actually always want to work in games since I was seven. Yeah, yeah. That's been... But you were I part of a strange generation where everyone started hiring really young and it was a it was The a end cycle. of that generation, yeah. I mean, yeah. the people who are slightly older than me who are the people like the founders of IGN who made made like a million dollars out of their stupid website that they did. And people like, you know? yeah, people like the, Stu the dot Campbell com boom. as well. Yeah, yeah. What? Like, Stu Campbell. <laughs> does um, he make a lot of money out of something? Oh no no sorry but like he was he he uh, started writing for Amiga magazines when he was like fifteen or something. Oh that's right yeah I mean that yeah. that generation really did, you know come mm. and look at but it's because the only people who knew anything about games back then were literally teenagers. Yeah. Whereas yeah. For, for for there was a group of people about maybe three four years older than me like Rupert Lohman who owns Eurogamer, and uh, you know other people mm. like that and and the guy a couple of the guys who did GameSpy and the IGN people who had their own website that they were running as a teenager and because of the dot com boom they just earned. Suddenly they became millionaires. Mm-hmm. There's another guy called um, Adam who had a website that got bought for a million dollars. He was 16 years old. I'm you trying know, to keep an eye on what all. the next boom is going to be. I'm pretty yeah, sure it's yeah. going to be crisps or eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty hot on eggs. I'm really hoping it's not crisps. I haven't invested enough time into them at all. Yeah. Well, I did really, really want to be a games writer since I was very little. So did I, I always so love you, doing it's, it. It's not like yeah, it's but not like I've yeah, I didn't fall into it, but still, it's I not, always it's not loved luck. doing it. But I never thought I could do anything like that. But I think that's the thing. Yeah, do it, but yeah. don't set out to do it. And but also, I always like, had a plan B though. I wanted to be a professor. That yeah, was the industry's massive. There's loads of stuff, and don't be disheartened. It sometimes people act like uh, a lot of people love industry drama. A lot of people love the idea of like whenever somebody leaves a website or leaves a company, everyone goes, "Oh my god, they were fired!" And like, everyone loves creating these tumultuous busy messy waters out of everything when actually things just come and shift and change and games are doing very well and games will continue to do very well and if you really love games it's not intent at all to want to work in games yeah. um, just don't put it as your only thing you want to do because otherwise yeah I've had so many people come up to me exactly the same as you Jim mm. acting as if you're the gatekeeper and it's just like I'm just a dickhead on the internet I yeah, don't have exactly. anything I can do to help you exactly. I think being a well rounded individual is useful it is it is if I see a bunch of CDs, is it that's why I sit at home and eat biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for listening to ourselves. Um, thank you for joining us, Kezza McDonald. Thank you. And uh, Jim Trinker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.